Hey everybody, welcome back to a new video. Today we're talking about the X38 crew return vehicle and if you're thinking that this looks suspiciously similar to the Dream Chaser spacecraft that is currently being developed by Sierra Nevada Corporation, well you're actually onto something. Let's have a closer look at this seemingly forgotten project. The Crew Return Vehicle, sometimes also known as a short Crew Return Vehicle, was a planned and completed project to build a escape spacecraft or lifeboat for the International Space Station, which sadly never came to fruition. But why did NASA come up with the idea for such a spacecraft? Well, the early space station proposals assumed that the facility would be equipped with a safe haven where the crew would wait for a rescue shuttle in case of emergency. However, after the Challenger disaster, in 1986, it became obvious that some sort of lifeboat would have to be added. Furthermore, even if everything went nominal, an unscheduled rescue attempt by the shuttle would cost approximately $200 million and, depending on weather conditions and the status of the fleet, could require as many as 15 to 45 days to effect which would be an unacceptable delay in case a crew member was critically ill. And so NASA's Johnson Space Center began examining the alternatives, which would need to address at least the following three scenarios. First, return the crew if the space shuttle was unavailable. Secondly, serve as an escape vehicle from a major time-critical space station emergency. And number three, it would serve as a full or partial crew return vehicle for a medical emergency. The International Space Station is actually equipped with a health maintenance facility to handle a certain level of medical situations, which are broken into three main classifications. Class 1, non-life-threatening illnesses and injuries, such as headache or lacerations, class 2, moderate to severe, possibly life-threatening, such as appendicitis or kidney stones, class 3, severe, incapacitating or even life-threatening scenarios, such as major trauma or toxic exposure. However, this health maintenance facility is not designed to have general surgical capability, so a means of evacuating one or several crew members in case of a medical situation that is beyond the capabilities provided by this facility was essential. Additionally, the crew return vehicle would need to address another two important factors. First, the G-loadings, which would need to be kept at a minimum when transporting patients with hemorrhagic issues, as well as provide a so-called shirt sleeve environment inside the spacecraft for the patients who couldn't be fitted into a spacesuit due to medical contingencies. Many possible vehicle designs were considered, including an Apollo-like design which had a moderate 3 to 4G entry profile and was a scaled-up version of the 1960s Apollo capsule capable of carrying 8 astronauts. Even a ballistic-type vehicle was also considered, although needless to say this was the least desired option to use in a medical emergency due to its many potentially medically hazardous design characteristics such as poor spin stabilization, high entry gravity profile as well as insufficient life support, protective gear and or clothing. One particular design that made it pretty far into the review process was the HL-20 crew return vehicle, which was based on a lifting body concept. Lifting bodies were a major area of research in the 60s and 70s as a means to build a small and lightweight manned spacecraft. A lifting body is a design in which the body of an aircraft or a spacecraft produces lift itself, in contrast to aircrafts with big flying wings. A lifting body is rather a fuselage with little to no conventional wings. This is because lifting bodies seek to minimize the drag and structure of a wing, all the way from subsonic to hypersonic flight, including re-entry of a spacecraft into the Earth's atmosphere. This made the lifting body the most ideal medical environment in terms terms of controlled environment as well as low G loadings during re-entry and landing. It could carry a crew of 8 and, as a matter of fact, the Dream Chaser, which is currently under development and is planned to play a major role in the future Orbital Reef space station, is actually an extension of the HL-20. 
And so in 1989, the HL-20 was pursued as a probable candidate for the crew rescue or return vehicle, which even led to the construction of a full-scale model for further research on human factors. About a year later, however, as soon as Congress saw the price tag on the HL-20 project, the program was cut from NASA's budget in 1990. At least $2 billion would have cost it to make the HL-20 happen, but that amount ended up being too much. And so the final X-38 crew rescue vehicle project came to life. NASA had briefly examined using the French Hermes mini shuttle and the off-the-shelf Russian Soyuz capsules as the space station's lifeboat, but finally decided to settle for the in-house X-38 design which was to be cheaper and faster. It still used the lifting body concept that was planned for the HL-20, however this new project used available technology and off-the-shelf equipment to significantly decrease development costs. The X-38 crew rescue vehicle was to measure 30 feet in length, 7 feet and 3 inches in height, have a wingspan of 14 feet and 6 inches, and have a cabin volume of 416 cubic feet, and had a maximum landing weight slightly above 22,000 pounds or 10,000 kilograms. It was a vehicle designed to return all six astronauts from the International Space Station back to Earth in case of an emergency, although it could carry up to seven people on board if needed, and it was projected for a launch on board the space shuttle, although both NASA and the European Space Agency agreed to develop a prototype capable of launching on board an expendable launch system such as the Ariane 5 rocket. Similar to the HL-20 and the current Dream Chaser, the X-38 vehicle had quite this sleek structure or airframe in this case. It was designed to autonomously Autonomously perform all guidance, navigation, and control functions. The the orbit burn, a parafoil assisted glide through the atmosphere, and land horizontally at one of the several predetermined landing sites. It was to remain in orbit for a maximum of three years, and a single mission could take all the way from 9 hours to as little as 3 hours if the mission was related to an emergency medical return, in which case the spacecraft would be capable of undocking from the ISS in as little as 3 minutes instead of 30, which would have been the normal undocking time period. The crew return vehicle would have also had its own berthing or docking modules, a total of two were to be built along with four spacecraft. The deorbit propulsion module was designed with a rocket engines that would generate a hundred pounds of force each, fueled by hydrocyne, which would burn for 10 minutes. Once the burn was completed, the deorbit module was to be jettisoned and most of its mass would burn up in the atmosphere. The G-load wouldn't exceed the 4G during atmospheric re-entry. Once inside the atmosphere, a drogue parachute would deploy, accelerating the vehicle enough for the main parafoil to deploy at an altitude of 23,000 feet and allow for a smooth gliding and landing. The parafoil itself was actually huge. It spanned 143 feet and occupied a total area of 7,500 square feet. The spacecraft's cockpit was designed without windows since they posed additional flight risks and added a considerable amount of weight. Instead, the crew return vehicle would feature a virtual cockpit window system in order to provide an all-weather, real-time 3D visual display to the occupants. Even though so far I've only mentioned NASA, the SAA was also heavily involved in the designing of the X-38. Among other, their contributions include the vehicle shape validation, an overall aerodynamic and aerothermodynamic database, crew cabin design and layout, the metal nose structure, the front and main landing gear, the thermal protection system blankets for the leeward vehicle surfaces including fins and aft, fuselage frame, the whole guidance, navigation and control software, including man and machine interfaces for the parafoil flight phase, and many more things. In order to test the spacecraft, four test vehicles were planned, including three atmospheric prototypes and one orbital test vehicle, although only two were actually built. These test vehicles were not as big as the final version would have been, they were in fact designed at 80% of its final size. Both were atmospheric test vehicles and were largely built of composite materials by the aerospace company Scaled Composites. Their names were not that spectacular 
spectacular vehicle 131 and 132 respectively. Vehicle 131 was later reworked with a modified shell, giving it a new name, V131R. These vehicles performed a total of 15 test flights between 1997 and 2001. Some of these flights consisted of non-piloted captive flights where the test spacecraft remained attached to its mothership and some others consisted of drop tests of up to 45,000 feet in altitude where the X-38 test vehicles glided at near transonic speeds before deploying their drogue parachute that slowed them down to 60 miles an hour. After this, a 7,500 square foot parafoil wing would deploy to allow for a smooth vertical landing. The mothership airplane used to perform the test flights was a Boeing B-52 which was also used as a long-range subsonic bomber. A 56 meter wide behemoth, around 83,000 metric tons heavy, only 744 units were produced in a span of 10 years between 1952 and 1962. The next step was to produce a third space capable prototype that was designed to launch to orbit in the space shuttle's payload bay. Its name was V201, where V of course stands for vehicle, and it almost made it to completion, around 90% before the project was cancelled in May 2003. As far as I know, this vehicle is still to be found at the Texas State Technical College. The X-38 crew return vehicle, even though it was to be a cheaper endeavor than the previous projects, was still cancelled, along with the rest of the crew return vehicle programs due to budget pressure associated with other elements of the ISS. At first, the cost of the X-38 section alone was projected at $96 million, but it ended up rising to much more than that. The estimated cost for the whole project, from development through the construction of four operational spacecraft, ground simulators, spare parts, landing site support facilities, and control center capabilities was at around $1.1 billion, which was actually less than half of the cost to manufacture a single space shuttle. After the cancellation of the crew return vehicle programs, NASA looked at a couple of other possibilities such as the orbital space plane or the Apollo derivative capsule, but none of these options really worked out and so it ended up being clear that the use of the Russian Soyuz capsule would need to be a long-term necessity. Alright everybody, I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the X-38 spacecraft. In the next video I will talk about Mechasila's muscle, that huge red winch that would allow the chopsticks to catch and lift both boosters and starships. So I hope to see you there too. Have a nice day, whatever you are, and I will see you all very soon. Take care. Bye bye.